Okay, well, I think we'll get going. So a very warm welcome to everybody to I think we've got IDS people here and also some colleagues from across the university and you're all extremely welcome to a seminar which um, is a bit of a joint effort from myself. So I'm <laughs> Melissa at IDS, um, Ian Schoons, Hayley McGregor, and also it should be said Annie Wilkinson, who was a co-author on the World Development paper that this draws on, um, but is on maternity leave and not with us today. So this seminar is about what we're calling post-pandemic transformations. Um, but of course, we're not yet post. The COVID pandemic, which has sent shockwaves through societies and economies right around the world, continues to do so. But despite the fact that we're not yet post, we felt um, and felt actually back in May when we first wrote the paper, but continue to feel that it's timely to reflect on some of the bigger questions that the pandemic is raising. Firstly, about epidemic preparedness and response, but far more broadly and more fundamentally about development, past and present and future. Our contention is that COVID actually offers really vital needs and now opportunities for some quite fundamental rethinking, which can begin to ask why was it that the world was so vulnerable and what needs to change in the future to mitigate harm from future threats. And it's the case that epidemics often provoke really big societal reckoning, but rarely on this kind of scale. So what we want to do over the next half an hour or so um, is summarise and elaborate an argument. And then we very much want um, questions, but also comments and feedback from all of you about the implications. So. The paper that we wrote, the fundamental argument, um, is that this massive global health, but also intersecting social, ecological, economic and political crisis that we're seeing enwrapped with the pandemic has highlighted and indeed intensified fragilities, fragilities in systems of all kinds, be it those that assure health and well-being, food, sustainable livelihoods, resilience ecologies, resource access, employment, trade, inclusive governance, and more. Um, those impacts in turn are being felt very unevenly. So what we're also seeing is an exposing of differences, of vulnerabilities across geographies, across social groups. And in many cases, of course, we're seeing deepening poverty and intersecting inequalities. Um, and potentially intensified authoritarianism. So what we're suggesting is that by revealing these fragilities, the pandemic is also exposing the limits of the conventional framings of development that underpin those fragilities. It's challenging mainstream approaches to capitalist development and actually long dominant development models, which have been those promoting economic growth, market liberalization, globalization, as well as carbon intensive industries, along with a kind of command and control planning approach. In doing that, it's also challenging the mainstream approaches to pandemic preparedness and response that we've seen, for instance, re-intensified recently by the WHO, which similarly to mainstream development, presume globally standardised, top-down and quite technical control measures. So there's a, a sort of doubling up of pandemic approaches and mainstream development approaches. But at the same time, what we're also seeing in COVID is the generation of alternatives, often rooted in local solidarities um, and also the potential for some strength and global solidarities and interconnections, which in turn challenge problematic north-south hierarchies. These, we think, and we'll elaborate, are key elements in a potential rethinking of both pandemic preparedness, but fundamentally development thinking and practice more broadly towards what we're optimistically calling positive post-pandemic transformations. So that's that's the argument. Um, so what we're going to do over this next little bit um, is to elaborate and illustrate this through five sections, each of which draws on sort of three things. One is reflections and examples about COVID, research we're doing on COVID, reflections on COVID. 
Secondly, though, from our longer experience on working on past big disease outbreaks and epidemics, including zoonoses, which go back to several decades, actually, um, to SARS, to avian flu, to HIV and to Ebola. So there are examples coming in from those earlier epidemics, which help to reinforce the points. And then we also draw on some strands of work broadly on social change and transformation, including many that are quite familiar to IDS, but haven't always been part of mainstream development thinking. So um, the order in which this goes, in a minute I'll hand over to Hayley, who's going to take the first two sections, which look first at the origins and unfolding and impacts of the pandemic, focusing particularly on political ecologies and then on inequalities. This in turn reveals three key challenge areas where rethinking is needed, and I'll turn to Ian to address the first two, Firstly, around science and politics in situations of uncertainty, and second, around economies, given the need for resilience. And then I'll pick up for a third, but perhaps one that's also more overarching, um, around the new forms of politics and citizen-state relations that we will need, perhaps, to confront future pandemics or indeed other crises, such as climate change, which are affecting the world. So, um, Hayley, do you want to, to start then with your next bit? OK, can you hear me now? Yes? Yeah. Great. So conceptually in the paper, we're arguing for a combining of structural and unruly perspectives. And in this regard, we've highlighted these two themes that are key to emerging diseases um, and which illustrate the importance of this dual perspective. So the first theme, as Melissa said, speaks to ecologies and the origins of disease and the second to inequalities and indeed the uneven impacts of outbreaks. So I'm going to summarize each in turn. So theme one, unruly natures and political economies and ecologies, this covers the origins of epidemics and the dynamic interactions at play. So the majority of new human diseases, as with COVID-19, have come from wild animals, often via livestock or poultry. And these zoonotic spillover events, if they, as they're called, are where disease agents transfer between animals to humans. And these actually occur quite frequently, but they don't usually result in significant outbreaks for a variety of reasons. But additionally, there's a question of whether and when human outbreaks are recognized, because in many parts of the world, people fall ill and they die of fevers of unknown causes, where, particularly where diagnostics are limited or death is then ascribed to other common causes. So there might be a delay or indeed a lack of recognition of an outbreak. But secondly, unpacking the conditions for disease emergence is actually quite key to minimizing these actual spillover events. But unfortunately, understanding of these processes at play is frequently quite limited. And this is partly because the environments where disease emerge, emergence happens are very unruly, complex and uncertain. And of course, there are various scientific techniques to try and uncover origins, such as phylogenetics. But as you've probably realized from COVID, the science can be quite inexact. And the argument that we make here is that the narratives about origins tend to focus blame at quite a proximal level, often without deeper knowledge of origins and transmission pathways or indeed local conditions. And the result is then that the um, often technocratic public health measures then focus the prevention efforts quite superficially. And these can then be both ineffective and damaging of livelihoods. So what would be the kinds of underlying causes and dynamics to consider that would create patterns of vulnerability. And it's actually in asking this question that we are arguing conceptually that one needs an understanding um, of um, zoonotic disease that recognizes both the complex dynamics of human, animal and ecology interrelationships, but also an understanding of these structural political economic conditions that sort of shape the, livelihood, the likelihood of spillover. So just to list a few such dynamics to give you a flavor. So firstly, um, intensive livestock production increases the probability of outbreaks. And 
For example, in the outbreaks of avian and swine influenza, it was the changing political ecologies and economies of poultry and pig farming that were key. So for avian influenza, and this is Ian's work, it was the growth of medium scale industrial units with very limited biosecurity in fast growing Southeast Asian nations where there was an increased demand for, for protein, animal protein that led to a particular set of outbreak dynamics. And then focusing from a public health point of view on culling the birds had a really devastating impact on farmers and traders in, in the avian influenza outbreaks. Secondly, one can also see how vulnerabilities arise from increased human wildlife interactions. And these are exacerbated by dynamics such as habitat destruction from commercial agriculture or unchecked urbanization or land grabs. And pathogen spread in this way is, of course, also facilitated by intensified interaction between these disease hosting wildlife and farmed or traded um, animals, which then act as intermediate hosts in, a, in an onward transmission to humans. And here, these dynamics are also um, shaped by human ecosystem changes and their structural causes, such as biodiversity loss or climate change or population displacements, conflicts, and so forth. So here is where we can think about the COVID example, because um, while zoonotic disease spillover likelihood is, is increased in wet markets or farmers markets where you have wild animals in close proximity and unsanitary conditions, we also need to ask in these instances how such conditions emerge, what are the politics of regulation in such, such places, who uses such markets, why are these animals hunted or captured, and so forth. And the cause of that spillover event is not necessarily only the wet market itself, but these wider ecological changes. And again, if the interventions there are reduced to treating the symptoms, such as focusing on the behaviors or regulating the wet market, that sort of misses the point. So in summary here, the structural drivers and these complex dynamics of socio-ecological change have to be con considered together if we're going to beware these very over simplistic and linear causal narratives of uh, zoonotic events. So to turn now to the second theme, which is around structural vulnerabilities and dynamic inequalities. So this theme covers the very uneven ways in which epidemics unfold, who they affect um, and how they affect people. And it really relates also to health inequalities and wider intersecting social um, inequalities. And I'm sure you're all aware that the racial and gendered and class dimensions of disease have really been vividly shown if one examines past epidemics. And this is what um, Farmer has referred to as structural violence, where diseases disproportionately affect the poor and marginalized. And this relates to longstanding patterns of vulnerability linked to colonial migration, conflict and, and many other forces. So a good example from, from a past outbreak here is Ebola, where the magnitude and impacts of the West African Ebola outbreak also reflected these deeply rooted histories of slavery, resource dispossession and underdeveloped health systems. And a similar story of differential disease risk um, is evident in the case of Zika congenital syndrome in, in Latin America, where it was those living in low income neighborhoods with poor sanitation, inadequate inadequate drainage and high mosquito populations who were most affected by the impacts of the, the infections. And of course, COVID-19, which has really highlighted inequalities and structural vulnerabilities, often also the history, um, the, the impact of histories of marginalization. And evidence of this is accumulating. It makes for very sober reading. And um, this was, of course, highlighted last week when Oxfam released um, a report aptly titled The Unequal Virus. So um, in the UK, for example, people in lower paid jobs, as you know, who couldn't work from home had higher exposure and mortality, and they were also more vulnerable to severe disease due to socioeconomic gradients in the underlying comorbidities. And in the UK and the US and other parts, other countries, it was black and minority ethnic groups that died at higher rates than others. 
And importantly, these inequalities are revealed um, in the case of COVID, not only in relation to disease burdens, as I've been describing, but also in how people are affected by actual um, public health control efforts. An example here is, is the situation of informal settlements, which were heightened, which were highlighted as because people were afraid of potential for uncontrolled COVID-19 transmission. But actually, it was the control measures that significantly affected um, in, uh, affected residents that relied on informal economies. And we also saw in India the terrible situation of labour migrants who really suffered when they returned to their rural villages. And the point here is that it's really exposed the artificial divides between informal and formal contexts and economies and how informal settlements and informal economies are often seen as peripheral to the cities but actually provide really essential services. And to summarise, really, we see how state-led responses to the epidemic didn't account for diverse livelihoods and there's now ample evidence of how public health measures can in fact reinforce marginalization and stigmatization. And this really reflects the blindness to inequality and social difference of pandemic health measures. And unfortunately, around the world, the social protection systems have really been sufficient. So to, to summarize, so contrary to the standard narrative of we're all this in this together and um, what we've seen is that the public health responses themselves can discriminate, they can accentuate long-standing structural inequalities, as well as interplaying with multiple and dynamic sources of marginalization, such as those that have actually emerged as the epidemic unfolds and have additionally required much more contingent responses. So I'll hand over now to Ian. Thank you, Hayley. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the second part of the paper, or at least the first part of the second part of the paper, which looks at three different challenges for development that are raised by this context of epidemics and COVID-19 in particular. And I'm going to focus just on two of these. First is a relationship between science and policy making, especially under conditions of uncertainty and the, indeed often ignorance. So as you'll know, there's been a huge amount made of so-called following the science in our collective response to the pandemic. But there are big questions raised about what science and how it is followed. And as we discuss in the paper, responses to past epidemics have made extensive uses of various forms of epidemiological modeling to define responses and choices and help prepare for outbreaks. But as all modelers know there's always much uncertainty in a model. So, for example, in avian influenza, in Ebola, huge predictions of impacts were made, but they didn't pan out as the modelers had predicted. And it was actually local actions on the ground and social relations that became particularly important in dealing with the unfolding situation. For COVID-19, uncertainties and sources of ignorance are, as we all know, legion and indeed changing fast. Early on, we were talking about transmission dynamics and age and comorbidity effects. Now, of course, it's, it's uh, virus variants, evolution of vaccine resistance and so on. Huge amounts of uncertainty. But reflecting on the broader global response to COVID-19, it's thinking about how science and policy interact that is really important and thinking about that in particular contexts. So in the UK, the SAGE expert group was actually really rather narrow. It was dominated by a particular type of epidemiological modelling and there were no social scientists or economists involved, at least at the beginning. And in the early stages, discussions concentrated around planning that had been done um, in relation to influenza outbreaks. And this affected the, the, the science advice early on. In the US, by contrast, under the Trump administration, as we all know, there was a very active sidelining of science advice with a resort to a variety of populist politics and positioning around the issue. But interestingly, in contrast, in East Asia, where there was, there's been much more successful responses to COVID-19. We've seen the science policy discussions were very different, 
particularly because there was the experience of, of, of SARS in 2003-04. And in Africa, the experience of Ebola, which we've already talked about, and the early experiences of HIV AIDS, both influenced expert advice. So we know that science is always constructed contextually. It's always culturally bound. Models as scenarios have their role, but they're necessarily limiting. Models, as we've written before, have social and political lives. But as we argue in the paper, you've really got to recognize how expertise comes from different sources. Diverse perspectives are important, including so-called lay insights and learning wider lessons across cases and countries is really important in responding to unfolding uncertainties. So as, as the pandemic has evolved, things have changed. There's a more adaptive learning approach involving local health officials, frontline doctors, local government patients and others that's emerged in the UK as elsewhere when uncertainties are being negotiated in real time in local contexts. But it must be said the dominant view remains the idea that expert science will save the day. A particular type of science advice, often blocking out uncertainty and ignorance in a form of elite consensus building is still widely advocated. And if you don't believe me, just look at some of the evidence quoted in the recent House of Commons Science and Technology report that came out last month. So a key lesson from all of this is, is the need to uh, think about and respond to uh, change and uncertainty. And with this, diverse forms of negotiated knowledge, whether about uh, disease preparedness or preparedness for any other uh, major shock, uh, whether that's climate change, financial shocks or whatever, such that uh, an increasingly reliable and resilient system is, is developed. This, we argue, has major implications for the way knowledge for policy is constructed and how science advice in development is organized. So the second theme that I want to, to move to now, we highlight the need to think about our understandings of all of this in relation to thinking about economies, economies in development more broadly. Again, the pandemic, as Melissa said at the beginning, has exposed major fragilities and fractures which have challenged long held assumptions. And there are many of these, but I've, I've only got a time for a few. Um, most fundamentally, I think the pandemic has has questioned some of the really core assumptions of a globalized neoliberal economy dominated by the pursuit of risk and reward, profit and growth. And instead, again, as Melissa mentioned at the beginning, the importance of resilience, the ability to respond to shocks and uncertainties and protect all populations, including the marginalized, has been really emphasized. This, I think, has some profound implications linking to many long run, run themes in development studies. First, I think around work and labor, a theme we discuss in the paper. We now know, as Haley mentioned, who are the key and essential workers in society, often, the, often in highly precarious jobs with women, ethnic minorities and migrants disproportionately involved. Big questions are raised. What are their rights and protections? How can economies be organized around labor, not just around profit? The pandemic, I think, has, we argue in the paper, suggested a fundamental reorientation of priorities for a different type of economy, addressing the contradictions that Nancy Fraser explores between care and capital, between profit making and life making. Second, the ideal of so-called just-in-time efficiency and global connections in manufacturing and trade has fundamentally been challenged. We've seen this particularly around food provisioning during the pandemic, often with the most resilient economies where there was local, short, flexible value chains, often based on collectively organized and informal arrangements. This too has, I think, big implications for thinking about economic development, trade, and so on. Third, as Mariana Matsukato and others argue, the pandemic has raised really important questions about what we mean by public purpose and value. 
and with that, the role of the state in fostering these. So take vaccines, for example, an amazing success globally in record time, but driven actually by long term investment by the public and philanthropic sectors for the public good. Again, this challenges a simplistic view of market fundamentalism, the idea that innovation can always be captured for private use through patents, for example, and the assumptions that only the private sector can deliver. New state market alliance, this is suggested, with the state in an important and different role, driving R&D investments, supporting patient capital, and promoting a progressive industrial policy. Now, of course, these are all long-running development debates discussed in IDS over 50 years or more, but they're coming back with a vengeance through the pandemic. And we argue such a reimagining of resilient economies around sustainability, degrowth, long-term state support and investment, solidarity economies, collective commoning, and so on, presents really profound challenges, I guess, to contemporary practices of capitalism. And so with that, a fairly major rethinking of development policy and indeed development studies is suggested. Now, post-pandemic transformations will have to address major challenges, and we discussed some of these in the paper. These include the emergence of new forms of powerful capital, such as the big data-driven firms, Amazon, for example, the costs to states of ongoing instabilities due to challenges of coping with an endemic virus, but also combined with climate change and other threats, and perhaps increasing forms of populist economic nationalism and so restrictions on trade and growth for some. And with this may be demands for redistribution from those left behind by the pan pandemic. All of these challenges and all these implications, we argue, have major implications for development and also major implications, implications for thinking about politics, which is why I'm now turned to Melissa. OK, Ian, thank you. So um, moving on now to this broader question about politics and political transformation. And again, starting with COVID and epidemics, but also moving out to broader implications, because what we see is that a significant disease outbreak requires public health measures, and those in turn necessarily shift and affect citizens' citizen state relations. So as we're seeing with COVID, where we've got lockdowns, movement restrictions, the requiring of new behaviours, the surveillance to monitor populations, all of these involve the exercise of state power. In the past, states of emergency have historically been used to extend power and abuse rights, um, and epidemics can provide the context for states of emergency. And indeed, there is some evidence today of some leaders using COVID-19 to do just that. We're also seeing with COVID that effective control, effective public health control, requires trust, it requires accountability, and it requires the need to be inclusive of all citizens if it's to work. And I think the UK provides us with, frankly, quite a good example of how that trust in regulatory measures can very easily be undermined um, to great cost. And in the UK, we've seen it, um, a, a citizen state contract such as there was, has been undermined by privatisation of the response, by the alleged corruption of key response infrastructures such as test and trace, by political leaders flouting the rules imposed on others, the, the Donald Cummings affair, and indeed by histories of marginalisation and discrimination by the state against particular places and groups, often deeply embedded ones, um, which I think um, underlie, for example, the greater degrees of vaccine hesitancy currently being expressed disproportionately by black and ethnic minority communities. In London at the moment, there only 57% of those people are expressing confidence in the vaccine, whereas it's nearly 80% for the total population. So marginalisation, inequality, the undermining of trust, partly affecting why the UK response has been has faltered. We can though also look um, at other outbreaks to, to understand the importance of trust and inclusivity. 
So turning to the West African Ebola outbreak, um, we had here a situation in Sierra Leone and in Guinea where trust and a reliable social contract was deeply lacking because of a long-term legacy of slavery, of colonialism, of conflict, and of the failure of state provisioning in previous decades. And, and here, communities had trust neither in the health system, nor in their government, or indeed in foreign interveners, and nor were those community members trusted by those authorities and outsiders um, to know what was best for them. So building trust actually required some tangible improvements and work, improving services, but also dialogue and relationship building. And it was only when that happened and that respectful dialogue supported by truly representative leaders um, began to take hold that we saw the changing of critical behaviours such as around safe burial and quarantining. And that's what shifted the course of the epidemic. So I think there's some learning there. There is also some learning from the parts of the world where we are seeing citizen-led and community COVID responses, both to disease and to mutual aid to mitigate some of the impacts. Sometimes they've emerged through force of circumstance, but they've variously been driven by community groups, by neighborhood networks, by local civil society, as well as by others. Diaspora networks have been important, religious organizations, and sometimes local business networks. Um, whether you're talking about um, the low income settlement groups in, um, in Nairobi, um, which have supported people, or in Kerala, where women's networks have provided aid and food to people. And what we also see is that some of the most impressive examples of effective and sustainable response are emerging in countries where this and in places where this kind of bottom action, bottom up action is supported by the state both with recognition and legitimacy and also with resources. And local government is often playing a key role. Sometimes it's municipal governments, sometimes it's decentralized local government arrangements. Um, and what's also appearing very interesting is that countries and places which have longer term experiences of this kind of multi-level inclusive governance and development around other issues, such, for instance, as Bangladesh, where we were hearing in the last Sussex Development Lecture about how approaches to poverty reduction and climate change adaptation have proved to offer valuable rehearsals, in a way, for multi-level, decentralised, bottom-up, inclusive development are now being mobilised for COVID in rather effective ways. And I think there are important lessons here, both from the ways that past approaches to inclusive um, state-led but linking into local development in epidemics can, um, can help other crises and vice versa. And also, frankly, lessons from other countries for the UK, which has its history of hollowing out of local government, which was then sidelined in the COVID response to massive cost. So around politics then, I think we're seeing how important state citizen alliances are in times of crisis and also beyond. And this is epidemics, but it's other kinds of crises as well, from climate change to economic crisis. Trust, inclusive collaboration, collective action, mutuality are some of the key watchwords, um, complemented by what one might call an ethics of care, of respect and of empathy. It points to the need, I think, for a new style of politics, which is on the one hand embedded in communities and in egalitarian norms, appreciating all the differences within as well as between communities, yet supported by a trusted, accountable state. So where does this take us um, more broadly, moving out of this, this kind of argument about politics and citizen state to wider development? I think what we're finding um, in the analysis we've done for this paper is that um, the recent history of epidemics suggests that COVID and what's happened with COVID isn't actually that unexpected or that unusual. Some of some similar dynamics, dynamics around um, environment and ecologies, around inequalities, around economies, around science and uncertainty and politics have happened in previous epidemics. But COVID has added to those and perhaps has now begun genuinely to force um, the moment for a major rethinking, 
not only, as we've suggested, of epidemic preparedness and response, but quite fundamentally of the many areas of development theory and practice um, that those responses implicate and draw attention to. Um, whether that's around the ways we think about environments and ecologies and climate change, um, the importance of inequality to development and bringing that centre stage, the role of science and evidence and expertise in policy making and development, the role of economies, resilience and the nature of value and the need for care, or indeed the politics of state citizen relations in transformations. So these are some of the, the key sort of presets and elements that we think now need to be centre stage. Um, if we're going to have development approaches into the future that can help anticipate and respond to shocks which are inevitably going to happen and then inevitably going to arise with similar degrees of uncertainty and implications for inequality that we've seen, I think, through COVID. And what that means um, that we, we need to do in our thinking is both um, to reveal and challenge some of the structural conditions and power relations and in the political economies that have created those risks and vulnerabilities in the first place, while also accepting this need for more flexible, contingent, negotiated responses um, in the face of the greater unruliness and uncertainty and complexity that we also see. So this was the kind of conceptual duality that runs through the paper about, on the one hand, structural conditions, and on the other hand, unruliness and uncertainties. I think we also see that lasting transformations are going to need to address both of those things, but also some quite fundamental matters of power and politics. There are plenty of good reasons and incumbent interests, which means that th why things haven't changed. Um, and I think there is a real need now to challenge those at the same time as fostering these more hopeful alternatives and innovations. It means, I think, fundamentally enabling a more caring and inclusive, perhaps convivial approach to development and one in which knowledge and learning from diverse people and places have key roles to play. And finally, um, and perhaps one of the biggest take homes from, from this reflection that we've undertaken, is the importance, um, really underlining the importance of a universal and perhaps one might say decolonized approach for develop to development. For what we've seen with COVID, more than previous epidemics, um, is that as both the health and humanitarian and development crisis and the inequalities and precarities that it's exposed, these have been felt just as much in the UK as they have in Bangladesh or in Kenya. They've been felt as much in New York as they have in Nairobi in different ways, not in a universal way, in a way that has always has the textures of histories and the particular politics of place, but nonetheless felt deeply. And it's been really interesting to see how issues that we might have seen as part of a development lexicon and aid programs that happen elsewhere are now being brought home and thought about and acted upon um, in the UK, in Europe, in the US. Issues of social protection, basic income for sustainable livelihoods, supporting informal economies, arguments about universal health care provision. These are now being posed across the world. And I think we're also seeing the scope for much learning by the UK and the US um, from other countries, from Asia, from Africa and elsewhere, especially around this question of state citizen relations and the importance of this inclusive um, state informed and supported yet bottom up approaches. So maybe, just maybe, that universality that we embrace at IDS, that's promised in the UN Global Goals, and yet has so often been embraced so very weakly in Western domestic policy agendas, maybe it's finally come of age. And with that, maybe we might hope for a further deconstruction of the colonial assumptions and power relations that have long beset development studies and practice and the real strengthening now at this moment of a more decolonized, inclusive, diverse, equitable sharing of knowledge and resources supported by this ongoing challenging of historically embedded power dynamics. So that's the hope. 
And if at this point such far reaching transformative change doesn't emerge, we think and we conclude the paper by saying that the project of development will have failed and future shocks, for they will surely come, look set to wreak even greater havoc. So that, I think, is the challenge, but perhaps also the opportunity for all of us. So that's an argument. It's some evidence, but we would love to hear from all of you. So we're now going to open up for questions and for comments. Um, you can either um, stick your hand up and, and speak them out, and that would be great. Or if you're feeling shyer, you can put them in the chat and I will relay them. Just to note, I think you will all have picked up that this seminar has been recorded um, because we want to be able to make it make it public on the IDS YouTube channel and the website. Um, we will continue to record the discussion, but if you have a question or a comment that you really don't want recorded, please just say so and James will kindly pause the recording um, so that people can feel free to speak candidly and freely and indeed critically because we want to hear from you. So. Um, open now to questions and comments. Um, who'd like to start? I've got a hand up from Jadeep. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Melissa uh, and Ian and Haley for that uh, fascinating talk and the paper as well is is deeply erudite and indeed it, it sort of helped many of us think through some of these issues because they're so complex and so fast changing. Um, one of the issues that you didn't uh, address in the paper was vaccination. Uh, and I wondered if uh, I could ask for your reflections on the unequal rollout of the vaccination, both between countries, but importantly within communities as well. You spoke of differences between and within communities. But, you know, in some quarters, certainly in the popular media discourse, there is an assumption, it seems, that these inequalities don't matter or won't matter because it'll all equal out in the end. But I suppose there is a question uh, whether it will equal out. Uh, and even if it will, uh, is there a risk of hardwiring in some of these irreversible negative impacts where, or as a result of some vulnerable people having access to the vaccine, vulnerable but resourced, and other vulnerable folks not having access to the vaccine? Yep. Um, great question, and I'd love to come back on that, but let's take a few. Let's, set, let's take a set of comments and, and questions. So I think um, Shandana next. Hi everyone, thank you um, for that paper. I was trying to, I've, I've read it with great interest and it's got, um, it, it talks about so many um, uh, different issues in there. So I was really, this is more of a comment um, in terms of um, just the, the sorts of conversations we should be having that have come out of this and both this paper, but also during the pandemic that I think need to be re-emphasized. So it's not so much a question as sort of just underscoring some of that. And one of that really is the fact that until recent, I was really very happy to read about the emphasis in the paper on local government, because until very recently within political science and within governance, decentralization had really started to fall off as this quite obvious, but just, you know, now enough discussion having happened on it and and uh, not quite part of the conversation. And it's quite telling the extent to which recent conversations, as well as your paper, have come to emphasize that. And I think it does a great job in talking about the impact and the where and what we need to now think about or rethink. But I think some of the challenges that we'll face, and I've started a sort of basic conversation on this with Haley recently, is about how to actually make that happen. And how do you bring local government and public health in conversation with each other in the sense of needing to now take seriously the challenge of democratizing public health? Because it really has fallen um, off the burner. Very often, immediately you'll fall into, you'll face um, uh, issues of resource and training and capacity. Um, but it, this this has underscored more than ever that we need democratized public health services that work very closely, not just communities, but with the state playing a very purposive role in in needing to do that at the local level. And I think you've you've highlighted some very good examples of that. But I think our work now needs to really start digging into why this works better in some places and why some countries manage that and others were not able to. So I think a re research agenda around that would be very helpful. 
brilliant. Um, we'll we'll definitely come back to that one. Let's let's take a few more. So Jody. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Um, that that was great. Thanks for the presentation and for the paper. Um, and I've I've got um, not so much question, but just some things in there that really chimed with areas I've been thinking about and um, so I'll, I'll just there's three things I'll mention them quickly and just see if uh, there's any reflections on those I mean these all I think stem from the notion of multi uh, level inclusive governance and particularly obviously from my perspective looking at the economic side of that but also how it relates to other areas so there, there's three uh, points one is is around the importance of the local and that in in some ways reflects uh, Shandana's comments on decentralization as well but in terms of the economy sometimes an emphasis on the local uh, taken to its extreme takes us to autarky and a sense of you know pr protecting ourselves and and disassociating from processes of globalization that have been damaging but you know also the interconnected global economy is it's important, I think. Um, so one, you know, how, how do we protect the local without ignoring the global? Two, um, the interrelationship between the the different element that you know the three different elements you look at in the paper, um, and how do they do they support uh, uh, particularly the positive side of it or the solutions you proposed? Do you see them supporting each other? So on the economic, we've been looking. Uh, very briefly, we tried to look at the evidence around the relationship between economic participation in the sense of participation in governance and decision making and political participation. And although intuitively it mm -hmm. would seem that if, if you've got more voice in your workplace, more sense of, um, uh, of engagement in your workplace, you're likely to translate that into the political arena, but the evidence is, is actually mixed. And the thirdly, very briefly, is about the support of the government for these local bottom up movements. And that comes out really strongly in the social and solidarity economy as well, the sense that you do want and need that government support. But some caution or fear about government co-opting the, the sort of the bottom up for their own ends. So those are just three yeah. sort of areas of future research or reflection. But any comments would obviously be welcome. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, let's move straight on because we've got we've got lots. So colleagues, I'm just going to take take a whole set because these are also really good comments and actually really, I think exactly what we hope to sort of ground this more epidemics focused analysis in those bigger implications for the areas of development that we all think on think about at IDS and with with partners. So that's that's just what we hope. Um, so Alex, turn to you next. Great, yes, thanks. I'd like to reiterate the congratulations and thanks for the paper and, and for the excellent presentation. Um, so there's lots in it that, that's very attractive and stimulating, but in thinking about two of the things that really appealed to me, I was struck by the risk of a contradiction between them, and I wanted to ask for your help in, in thinking through that. So the, the emphasis on revealing historically embedded power dynamics and challenging incumbent power is obviously fundamental. Um, but these, there's also this really attractive emphasis on um, a more convivial approach, on openness uh, to other knowledges, and it strikes me that there might actually be a bit of a problem of a tension between the two, because we know that challenging incumbent power is um, broadly historically going to be driven by anger at injustice, right? This is, in other words, the weaponizing of the growing inequalities that the pandemic has accelerated as a source of popular anger of the unruly politics to which you allude in the paper um, and that depends on polarization it depends on you know a high level of, of uh, oppositional mobilization which would appear to be very counter to the conviviality and of course what we've seen in the pandemic is that the, the particularly um, wicked if you like dynamic whereby the conviviality that requires people to come together whether that's in the street to protest or in each other's houses to to act in solidarity and practice acts of care is associated with risk and fear right and is and mm -hmm. you know know about the measures the use of measures we follow this in the navigating civic space component of a3a the way in which governments bring in restrictions on the occupation of public space in the name of public health but actually to uh, to preclude protest and so on 
So the conviviality has been made dif more difficult by the nature of the pandemic, but of course also by the politics that were dominating many mm. polities before the pandemic and actually which have not gone away. Trump lost, but his vote went up. Bolsonaro's vote is up, right? Um, Johnson's ratings are up. Right. So the politics of polarization has not been beaten by the pandemic, has not been uh, pushed aside by a new social yearning for conviviality. It's alive and kicking hard. So how do we get to conviviality through anger, if you like? Because the injustices of the pandemic has revealed and deepened the resource grabbing, the stigma and blame, the, the all, all of the stuff you described very eloquently should be driving us to anger. But that anger is also leading us to reach for certainties and for slogans and for the simplifying mobilizing power which of course is inimical to being open to diverse knowledges uncertainty and complexity so if you could help us out with how we how we reconcile those tensions that would be wonderful thank you Alex thank you I think you've hit a rather fundamental question there but we'll we'll say what we can so I'll just quickly take um Max and then Marie's and then we'll come back to to some of these I think so Max Hi, yeah, I'm, Hi. I kind of just want you to answer Alex's question because it's fascinating, but I'll ask mine anyway. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll, I'll chime in with everybody who spoke before me and just saying that this was an absolutely fantastic paper and I really enjoyed it, not just for the for the rich knowledge on um, on, on these kind of different uh, experiences to epidemics, but also I thought it was just a, a wonderful advertisement for development studies in a way through kind of going from Polanyi to, to Matsukatu and, and kind of bringing in so much of that diverse literature. Um, the, the bit that kind of in, I, I kind of focused on most because it connects most to to, to what I work on, um, it, it, it makes this very intuitive and, and, and very convincing argument for recognizing local solidarities and, and local initiatives in, in managing this this pandemic and uh, citing you know from from Kerala to um, Nairobi the, these bottom up initiatives which clearly should be a part of of how we think about building back different or however we're we've decided to build back now um but maybe chiming in a little bit with, with shandana's comment as well um these are initiatives that are also set up by groups who have kind of in a way always existed in a way always mobilized informal networks and resources to kind of build around the various inefficacies of of formal um structures of provision but there are also groups that have seen their resources eviscerated in the last couple of months that mm -hmm. have seen their kind of all the, the social uh, resources, time, financial resources that they draw on um, uh, put under enormous strain and have yet still still kind of um, managed to to organize mm -hmm. these um, these uh, various initiatives. And there's clearly a tension here between on the one hand, remembering that and building on that and at the same time, making sure that we're not essentially formalizing an additional burden on these communities that we're not adding you know a, a double and triple burden on these groups um that we're not in a way um shifting responsibility downward um and uh, you know in, in kate mars words kind of cannibalizing informal structures um to yeah. especially in an era that we're now moving in of of increasing concerns about fiscal uh, limited fiscal resources by by states and, and formal structures um, so that's my question, but I'm also just terribly interested in what Alex just said. Yeah, excellent. Um, so, Marys, do you want just to come in there, and then we'll we'll come back and try and try and respond to some of these? Yes, thank you so much again. Just to echo what everyone's saying, this has just been so um, incredibly helpful in 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 giving a, a a a global picture, but also allowing us to see the link between the micro and the macro and the global and the establishment of patterns of reoccur reoccurrence independently of what uh, pandemic we're talking about is so helpful. And I have two very, very quick questions. The one is on um, the nature of how inclusive is our inc inclusive lens is on um, inequalities, because it, it seems to me that we've, we've made such incredible inroads in recognizing the gender inequalities um, dimension in pandemics. We've recognized formal and informal as one of the elements, not only, but uh, one of the elements associated with class. We've recognized the geographic discrepancies between um, North and South and, and a wide array. But despite the historical evidence going back as far as the Middle Ages of, for example, pogroms being um, 
the, the fate of Jews who were blamed for, 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 for the plague um, up to this minute now where we just we, we do see um, the targeting of groups where there is an intersection of poverty and religious um, affiliation. And I think that to me is particularly important because it's not just inequalities in terms of access to resources, in terms of social and economic exclusion. We're talking here about violence and about mobilization of hate um, by some of the very same groups who are um, the subjects of or experiencing extreme inequalities on the basis of gender, class and mm. other elements. Um, so my question here is, what would it take for the development paradigm and for IDS for us as a community to also in to integrate and incorporate into our own lens the question of the, re the religious inequalities intersecting mm. with poverty, gender? What would it take for IDS, for us as a, as a community to recognize that incorporated and then for the broader development paradigm? The second okay. question, um, which relates in some way, is to do with the politics of it all. Um, because yeah. we've, we've seen a narrative of the war against coronavirus, this idea of a war being waged. But we also know that we are living in a world where there are proxy wars happening all the time in all sites. And this is a global phenomenon. This is no longer the Cold War context of proxy wars for the US and and, and the former USSR. This is proxy wars by everyone from Turkey to um, uh, Pakistan to India and so forth. And just on that as an example, I mean, we, we have in, 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 in India, we are, uh, there is a mobilization of hate around Muslims being accused of um, engaging in a, a kind of jihad via the spread of coronavirus. And on the borders in Pakistan, um, they're accusing the Shia Muslims of a Shia virus um, and so forth. So this is, again, there is this big politics, big key politics with another small P, small sort of proxy war or a, a small P proxy war, which is the mobilization of hate around groups that you want to eliminate. And how do we bring those into also our analysis of the of that sort of geostrategic politics of proxy wars with um, that kind of political economy use of of other smaller wars? I'm sorry to have been so long and convoluted. No, um, okay, that's brilliant. Well, look, I'm going to jump in and respond to the first and the last, and then I'm going to hand to Haley and Ian to deal with some of these really tricky and challenging questions in the middle, or maybe I'll do that, because I can't resist saying something about vaccines, which I've worked on for a really long time, and Jaidi, vaccines really do matter, and um, if we'd written this paper a bit later, probably the vaccine dimension would have been um, quite central to it, um, big, as, as it is now to our thinking and the other work we're doing on the COVID pandemic through our pandemic preparedness project and other things. And essentially, I think there's obviously there are two two really important things going on. One is a big global debate about vaccine justice versus vaccine nationalism, um, as um, certain countries um, seek to seek to control supplies. Um, we've we've intervened in that through through public letters, but it's also a, a, a very big problem. It's a problem for controlling the pandemic, but it's also, I think, interestingly, an example again of a repetition in the vaccine context of a lot of other broader development arguments about economic justice, about trade justice, about climate justice um, versus economic or climate um, or trade nationalism. So I think we're seeing, again, bigger development debates playing out through this global um, in, injustice debate about vaccines. And then within countries, although um, the countries which do have vaccines are, they're a little bit concerned, but they're not as concerned, I think, as they should be about unequal distribution, because there's still an argument that herd immunity only requires a level of the population to be, to be vaccinated. Um, and that is a problem, firstly, because of um, because you might never get to that level. Secondly, because the inequalities and the vulnerabilities are going to play out of, against those who do not get that vaccination. And thirdly, because vaccine hesitancy is always a manifestation of distrust and marginalisation, often quite deeply rooted. And it's pretty telling that the groups who are reticent about the vaccine in the UK um, are precisely those groups who also haven't necessarily found it straightforward 
to follow lockdown regulations in a trusted in a trusted way and indeed are alienated from the state with respect to all kinds of other economic and social dimensions of life so so it matters for for the course of the epidemic it also matters for inclusive politics um and just turning quickly to to marie's i i really like that well, I don't like it, but that phrase epidemic as a proxy war, I think is very, um, is very captivating and I think is quite accurate in, in, many, in many ways. And the mobilization of hate um, is certainly happening and the mobilization of hate among, um, against religious minorities is absolutely a part of this. Um, and I think we've seen it strongly with, with, with COVID. Um, the work of your own colleagues programme and partners under Creed, I think, has been absolutely path breaking in bringing these things to the fore. It also takes me back, Marys, to a paper you and I wrote together about swine flu um, back in 2009, where the Egyptian government used the swine flu epidemic and the labelling of swine to go on the rampage against Coptic Christian minorities. Um, and and that was in a sense another example. But but the response is absolutely religious inequalities have to be thought of as part of that intersecting mass with class, with gender, with place, with race. Um, and if COVID does, I think we were already learning that. And if COVID doesn't again provide one of those moments when when that becomes too obvious to ignore any longer, then that will be a bit of a travesty for development. So turning now, um, Hayley and Ian, do you want to pick up on some of these some of these other questions from Shandana, from Alex, from from Max and from others? And Jodie? OK, I can come in briefly. Um, I think they were fascinating comments and questions. This is precisely the kind of um, comment and discussion that we can learn from. And many of you know more about these particular areas of literature. So this is really fantastic. Just to make another point on the vaccines, first of all, I mean, I think um, the point Jaideep was making is absolutely taken that the rollout again is going to mirror existing inequalities and, and existing inequalities in access to care. And I think um, Jaideep, I know you're probably also speaking from the your knowledge of the Indian side. I mean, I think yeah. this particularly in countries where you have very strong um, private sectors of medicine with very entrenched power relations, this is going to be a real issue. I don't know if Jerry's on the call, but I'm sure he would have really interesting conversations. And indeed, in, in South Africa, of course, which is where I'm particularly concerned, it's a real question about how they're going to ensure that those who can buy vaccines, even if they are vulnerable, are not going to get greater access. So it, that's a really good point. And also just, of course, to make the point that it's not just about inequality in supply, it's also about inequalities, again, coming back to this point in the infrastructures and, um, you know, um, many places where you don't have the, the vaccine syringes and so forth. So in a way, in, to some extent, the focus on supply can kind of obscure some of those other um, Mm. issues that are going to make the real art difficult. Um, I really enjoyed several themes that came through in the questions related to this, um, you know, the balance between um, state-led um, approaches and resourcing and the bottom up. And I, I think your your caveats are absolutely taken. And I think um, Shandana's point about how one does kind of ensure this coordination at a decentralized local level. I think there are examples related to, to different structures for public health um, in country. And I think to some extent the UK might have had that, although there's been a real hollowing out of, of local public health in terms of resources, but government chose to be more centralized. And I think what one really needed was a coordination between, you know, sort of centralized approach with data collection and so on, but then really using local stru structures of public health that have local knowledge that can really reach communities. And, and somehow in the UK example, that sense of coordination has come very late, if at all, as we know from the whole um, test and trace debacle. And I, I think probably also the issue here with resourcing is around budgets and accountability. And, and Alex, of course, could say something about that, drawing on the work he's done in, in Brazil. Um, and um, and just to to Max's 
point again about is this moving responsibility down when one sort of potentially romanticizes the bottom up. I think this is something we've really worried about a bit in our own projects on pandemic preparedness because we we've really worked with this idea of preparedness from below but given the sort of intensity of inequalities and and suffering and and indeed the sort of precarious circumstances of people's lives and livelihoods I think it one really does have to think quite carefully of this very idea of, of bottom mm -hmm. up and we sort of developed it a bit further to to sort of move away a bit from that language and talking about negotiating intersecting precarities and to link back again to, you know, the work of farmer and others who've really pointed to the need to have the stuff space staff and systems, as he said, to kind of also support um, public health responses, support what, what people might do themselves. So I, I think that is an, a really a productive area to think further. And I think, again, from much of the work at IDS that I would certainly like to learn from around different governance ecosystems, what kinds of arrangements can allow greater accountability and can give one a whole range of, of responses that might improve accountability and um, response in an epidemic, including the unruly. And I don't know if Alex would would feel that I'm, I'm being unrealistic to suggest that maybe one can accommodate a, a range of, of strategies in different contexts. And then finally, sorry, Maurice, I missed a lot of what you were saying because I, I, I got kicked out for a minute, but I, I really enjoyed what I heard. And I think there are, I mean, one can give a positive narrative of what how we might transform but indeed they are real challenges and and you really spelt them out well i mean in many areas where one's seen militarization politicization of response it's it really does the sort of co-option of public health measures for other for other ends and i think from from someone who works in in health that's really sparked a big debate as well within public health of how quickly one can get um you know really uncomfortable sort of issues around justice and human rights and again i think potentially an area for for um, a lot of discomfort that has been generated and a real rethinking. Yeah, brilliant. And so, yes, I've been left with Alex's question. No, I mean. Well, we'll say Alex, a little bit more about the economy, I think, in relation to some of the economy discussions others, as well. Yeah. Good points, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the economy question also relates to the vaccine issue, mm. as I raised. Um, because we've, you know, we've we've run with the assumption that we we will fund private sector actors in order to produce a vaccine for public good. Who gets the profit? The private sector actors. Yeah. There has to be a renegotiation of that around vaccines. I mean, there's a wider talk of the people's a people's vaccine. There are quest, there are debates about citizen dividends from profits from vaccines, because this this virus and and its variants will will be endemic. Uh, the vaccines will continue to, to drive profit to a variety of different companies. And the funding for this has, by and large, come from governments and philanthropic organizations. So there's a, there's a deal there, you know, a question about the relationship between states and citizens and publics, uh, mm. which I think is quite fundamental about a rethinking mm. of economies. So, um, yeah, to this, I mean, the, the short answer to your question, Alex, is yes, there definitely is a tension between incumbent power, which, as Maurice quite rightly says, is often violent and discriminatory and, and so on, uh, and a, a vision of, of convivial, convivial mutuality and openness. But I think this is, this is just, uh, you know, this is development writ large. I mean, you know, mm. if we can't, as scholars of development, and this is why this debate and discussion this afternoon has been so fantastic. As scholars of development think about that tension productively, then we're not thinking about development. So, I mean, one of the things that we did on a very different context, thinking about sustainability, um, was to think about what do transformations mean? This was a discussion with the, with the Step Center Consortium. There's a paper that I can share on this. And, you know, to put it simply, we, we said, well, there are, there are three types of processes of change that have to happen, but they have to happen together. There's structural change, you know, bigger political economy shifts. Now, I think, you know, bigger political economy shifts come face to face with the power, the, with, with incumbent power, of course. 
But I think what the pandemic has shown and climate change is showing and the failure of neoliberal economy, economics more broadly is showing is that there are instabilities, fractures, disconnects, contradictions, if you like, within the existing system. Those are spaces for change as well. So structural mm -hmm. uh, engagement is, is key. Systemic engagement, engagement with policy. This is where local government and, and, and bureaucracies come in. Because we don't want to just get into a, syst uh, into a debate where it's all either local or it's all either big and structural. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in between. And I think this is really important. And we've learned a lot about that in the pandemic. Um, the failures of, well, the successes and failures of decentralized approaches, the lack of capacity in local government very often to do the type of things that are necessary, contact tracing. Why did it fail in, in the UK? Well, we didn't have that, well, we had that capacity, but it wasn't used. Um, it was all centralized, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole set of policy things that bureaucracies can engage in, which help transformation and help the processes of, of challenging these structural forces that keep the status quo, which is clearly failing. Um, but there are many there are many interests that that actually both profit from failure, you know, disaster capitalism and the rest. Uh, but also um, th th there's, a, there's the pattern of incumbency that that allows uh, means that change is difficult. But of course, the final thing is what we called enabling transformation. That's the bottom up unruly engagement in these open spaces but it's not just that it's not just that it has to be combined with the other and i think max's point is really key here is that expecting it all to happen from you know informal innovation and participatory action and bottom up this that and the other is is throwing mm -hmm. far too much onto people who are already precarious already marginalized mm -hmm. and may be subject to the violence that uh, Maurice was talking about before. But I, to be honest, you know, I mean, that's just a, a, anyone can come up with any tripart, tripartite framework to think about transformation. But my argument, and I think that's why development studies is, is a useful, as it were, platform to have these debates, because we can connect political economy with participatory approach, mm -hmm. with understanding of states and bureaucracies in a much more synthetic approach to understanding political change. And it's it's interesting that a lot of the debates that IDS has had over the years are coming back. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there was a whole strand of work on decentralization at, at IDS in the 80s and 90s. There has been a huge strand of work on care and new economies, going back to the early work on, on uh, fe feminist work on feminist economics way back in the 70s. And of course, there's the, the long strand of work on participation. I think these all need to have the dots connected much more yeah. in, in our wider conceptualization of what this is all about. And I think that then does mean, to reflect on Jody's comment, we have to connect politics and, econ um, politics and economy. The new politics emerge out of new social and economic organizations always. So if the new forms of organization that have existed around mutual care and support create new politics, well, that's also part and parcel of what we're talking about. And so I, I think recognizing the tension is important, but just being overwhelmed by it and despairing of it um, ain't going to get you very far. Mm. Ian, thank you. I think that was a, a, a brilliant answer and summation. I mean, we've got a little bit more time if anyone wants to come back or offer any further comments. Um, but equally, OK, John, brilliant. John Gaventa, put your hand up. Do you want to? Yes, I'm just trying to get it right Great. over there. Um, again, thanks very much. Really fascinating seminar and great answers to the questions. Uh, there as well. I was really struck, and just you know, I'm usually accused of being the optimist. I was struck by the optimism of the paper, and and encouraged by it. But but I do think these questions about the the call for revising, rethinking state citizen relations at a time when the state is closing that space for citizen engagement mm. so strongly, as Maris and Alex and others have mentioned, is is really we can't underestimate. Yeah. And as you know, we've been doing work on the closing the dynamics of that closing space, and it's both through hard power, 
uh, harassment, force, police brutality, disappearances, media closures, deportations, regulations, etc., and soft power, mobilization of fear, hate, stigma, harassment, etc. Um, and they, they really are closing that space that when, when we saw that initial mutual aid emerging, um, that's okay as long as it stays as an aid approach. But if it starts conflicting with the state, then, then the hammer will come down. And, and for instance, in the, you know, when we saw in Nigeria with the, with the emergence of the incredible movement there to the end, to the end SARS, not SARS the, the disease, but SARS the, the police power, um, the repression that happened and often has been yeah. much media attention has been, has been huge and really set that potentially transformative movement back. So we really have to keep in mind hard power and what's going on and the effects yeah. of this. On the other hand, our work shows, uh, and Alex can come in this as well, that that civil society actors are responding and we see both the emergence of new actors and new newly salient issues. And so therefore, I think that resonates to a couple of things that you talk about in the paper, but one that maybe you don't. Um, if you take a look at health and the emergence of the importance of the care economy, we're also seeing the emergence of doctors and health workers as politically active agents and recognizing their agency and importance because health is so salient now in societies. And I'm really struck that in response in the last 24 hours, in response to Myanmar closing of power, it's the doctors that are on the streets and the doctors that are causing mm -hmm. national strike. And I wonder if that would have been the case a couple of years ago. I don't think as far as I know, they were so active. So we're seeing that we also see new new issues of livelihoods, very, very important. But one that we're also seeing in our work that, that we don't work on much at IDS is the emerge the, the salience of education again. Education in terms of who gets access to knowledge, what, what digital forms and online presence they have, what's the kind of learning that can happen. And when the educational crisis emerges, who, what are the inequalities that are emerging? And a lot of civil society groups are engaging around that. So I think, you know, on the one hand, we have this the pessimistic view I started with, but on the other hand, we see some new actors emerging and some newly salient issues that would have been less critical. People were working on them before, but somehow they're higher in priority. And it's those issues where the structuring of a renegotiation of a social contract might, uh, might emerge from. Mm -hmm. Great, John, I think that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to turn back to Alex just quickly. Have you, Alex, is, is your hand up again or was it? It was unless anyone else wants to come in just to pick up on the point that John yeah, made. Yeah, no, I think that's that's just great. To, to, so to share a little bit more from the research to which John referred, but also to, to thank Ian for his emphasis on joining the dots, because the phrase that comes to mind is only connect. Right? <laughs> I study literature, so this is, you know, the enforced quote, connecting the unruly citizen agency motivated by an accentuated sense of injustice with a more elite politics of um, mm -hmm. complexifying um, would, would seem to be something of a way forward. And what we found in the research to which John referred is that our civil society interlocutors in the three countries with which we've worked in the Navigating Civic Space Project ha have become acutely, intensely aware of how the development industry drove them away from connecting with popular concerns and how the pandemic has opened up some opportunities to reconnect but with but how the enormous uh, challenges remain um, some of them deliberate action by states and other actors to drive that wedge and keep them from forming that elite non-elite alliance mm. and some of them simply the you know the political economy of aid what you can and can't get funding for as well as the restrictions of the pandemic itself so I think there is growing awareness among sort of elite capital city type civil society actors with whom we're all very familiar at IDS of the urgency of connecting with popular actors. Um, but no one's yet mapped out, I think, uh, how to make those connections happen in a way that joins together the energies of conviviality mm -hmm. and the energies of contestation and, and the moral economy. And I think that might be an interesting kind of next paper for, for the authors yeah, if i can yeah. put it out there perhaps absolutely and alex i would i would just add i mean the point has been made that this is going to look slightly different in different different contexts to do with to do with political histories and the nature of the state and political polarities and civil society and the degree to which it was open or closed or otherwise before before this setting 
Um, and I think one of the interesting optics now is that we've, with COVID, we've very much got the UK to focus on as well as one of the lenses through which things have not gone entirely well and can bring this into the lexicon. Um, I've got one more question from Peter, who I, who's put something very interesting in the chat. And Peter, I'm hoping you're going to going to speak to that point, because I think it brings us back to this point about universality, which would be a nice place to end. But um, I maybe you're going to ask something else. No, it's related to that, but it also thanks, Melissa, and thanks uh, to everyone. I mean, a great paper. This is an excellent discussion. It's the kind of thing uh, I think we do very well, and it's important to have, and it would be good to engage with others around these uh, these questions as well. Uh, I mean, in the, the question in the chat I, I put in, just really reflecting on the point that, you know, we've said very strongly that we believe we are, as a UK-based institute that works on global challenges, we have something to contribute to debate and dialogue uh, in the UK and, and to bring what yeah. we learn with our partners and collaborators into a UK context and to help to support learning. I was participating in a very interesting discussion last week and will be again this week around uh, vaccination certification and you know the question is what are we learning about that and of course um, what we hear for, through this debate is how much is actually being learned and how many incremental positive changes are taking place in so many ways. Many of those are taking place you know, in communities, with citizens, many of them are taking place at the policy level. And we don't necessarily always see those because they sometimes get shrouded in, you know, the sort of more unfortunate perceptions of, of political uh, power and views. But at the same time, there is a lot of positive change happening. I guess going back to Alex's point about uh, urgency and only connect, um, the big challenge for us, I think, is that we may get beaten by time. This is me now channeling my pessimistic view, because nature has a tendency to outstrip all human endeavor, uh, partly because of our contribution to it. When it comes to climate change, when it comes to you know the you know the reality that we will in the future face similar kinds of global health challenges such as this one, um, how much time do we actually have to actually try to help? Put things in place that will make a significant difference. So I think the more that we can, through our, you know, our ability to co-create knowledge with partners and collaborators, to convene and engage important conversations like this, to share views and get insights out into the public domain, it gives us an opportunity also to engage in the UK and to bring those lessons to bear and to see what we can do as far as we possibly can, given our remit as an independent research institution. Yeah to feed in to debates in the UK where the UK itself can contribute to those global, issue, uh, global issues and hopefully uh, perhaps whittle away at the ever diminishing time that we may have globally to act on some of these challenges. Yeah. yeah. Peter, thank you so much. And I mean, really, um, I think we probably do need to, to draw to a close now, but this has been a really, really interesting discussion. And I'm, I'm pleased that this paper which covers an enormous sweep, but it still manages to be very partial, as we've as we've now discovered in the in the discussion. I'm really hope I'm I'm really pleased that it stimulated this discussion. I mean, I think some of the take homes are about the need to join up, um, and and how actually COVID has cast the lens which which requires both the joining up of debates about epidemics with those around other crises, but about development in general and what development means and has meant. It enables us to join up a lot of long-standing debates going back to the very beginning of development studies um, with contemporary contexts and actually future contexts, a world in which um, crises and multiple crises and, and disjunctures and ruptures are just around the corner. Um, and I mean, COVID to some extent has, has, I think, taken attention away from the climate crisis that we're all, all facing and the economic crises going along with those. But this is, is the kind of world we're in. And I think it enables us to join up um, in a really important way the debates going on in the UK with those that have been happening with our partners in the context of development studies for a long time. And actually, in a way, to revitalise development studies at a time when we, I think many of us almost feel slightly apologetic because there is a view of development studies is that it is inherently um, colonial in its outlook and somehow enwrapped with aid. I've never believed that. I think those of us who co authored this paper don't think that's what development studies is all about. Development studies is 
about the critical constructive analysis of political, social and economic relations between people um, and the support to how progressive change in all its diversity can happen across the world. And it applies just as much um, to the UK and Europe as it does to the places that were once seen as the targets of so-called development. And I think that's the kind of view that we would stand by at, at IDS, but it's, it's, it's still a view that isn't what everybody sees automatically as what development studies is all about. And I think if we can work through COVID to do what Peter suggested to, to make sure that we're we're doing all we can actually to to bring about those more sort of instrumental kinds of policy impacts but at the same time take this important opportunity for some quite fundamental rethinking or bringing to center stage a lot of the thinking that i think has been going on in mar in, in ids but has sometimes been a little bit marginal now it needs to be at the forefront and this is a moment for that to happen so um Thank you all so much for your questions and comments. Those who want to, to follow this up, um, the recording will be available. I think we're going to put out a blog next week, which people can, can respond to and we'll share it a little bit more widely. And people have put in the chat a number of other discussions which are related that we can follow up. So thank you all and have a very good rest of the day. Thanks so much for your Thank comments. you very much. Yeah. Thank you.